Falling down, falling down. Society a broken promise. Economies war, citizen whores. Political pimps leaving us flat on our backs. Trading today, waiting for the promised land. First time, I'm glad to see you here, and I'm glad that I'm here. And if I say anything uh, that you don't agree with, let's just leave it at we don't agree about it, all right? There's no clear thought being exercised right now in the American public. They're allowing the insanity of the leaders, you know, to make decisions, all right, that really are not in the best interest of the public. They're not in the best interest of the children of the public. They're not in the best interest of the grandchildren of the public. They're not in the best interest of the earth. They're not in the best interest of anyone. I felt as though someone knocked me unconscious when I entered the world. It's been a lifetime trying to come to. I used to get this idea that I was in the wrong time and the wrong place. I thought that I came here a hundred years too late. A hundred years too late was because I used to see this camp on the plains, amongst the trees, by a river. It was a tribal camp, and I felt I was a part of it. It's like these thoughts were memories. Every part was familiar, and I was a part of the whole thing. There was another place, another dream. I can still physically see this camp. It was in the mountains somewhere. And my job was to keep peace with the wolves, keep peace for my people, to make this alliance. Crazy horse. We hear what you say. One earth, one mother. One does not sell the earth to people walk upon. We are the land. How do we sell our mother? How do we sell the stars? How do we sell the air? Crazy hearts, we hear what you say. The spirit of life is almost non-existent in the perceptual reality of the society that we're in. It's almost non-existent. They got religion, they got civilization, you know, they got military, they got politics, they got all education, they got all the stuff, but they don't have the spirit to live. I want you to listen to this man speak. <laughs> His name is John Trudell. I'm a member of the American Indian Movement and I'm from the indigenous nations of the Western Hemisphere. As the indigenous people, we have watched. We have watched this thing happen on our hemisphere. We have seen what has happened. We have seen them come in and confuse and attack. We understand that the issue is the land. The issue is the earth. We cannot change the political system. We cannot change the economic system. We cannot change the social system until the people control the land and then we take it out of the hands of that sick minority that chooses to pervert the meaning and the intention of humanity. Welcome back. This is Radio Free Alcatraz from Indian Land, Alcatraz Island in California. This is John Trudell speaking for the Indians of all tribes and uh, as part of the show we have that uh, the government has been practicing a policy of taking what they need from the Indian people, well not necessarily what they need, taking what they want from us just by any time that they would like to do so and they've been doing this through the years or doing it today. And uh, I would say that a large majority of the people out in the average, the average American people don't, aren't even aware that this is going on. And maybe that's why this, the 
Hollywood is allowed to get away with this. The garbage is piling up. The lighthouse is broken. But they say it's no worse than living on a typical Indian reservation. This is a country where all men are created equal and it's the land of the free and the home of truth and justice and liberty for all. Well, we want to know why that doesn't apply to us. So if this is the land of the free, then we want to know why we don't have the respect and dignity that all free men are accorded by other free men. The government had declared Alcatraz surplus property. Young Indian nationalists claiming an old treaty right to unneeded federal property descended on the island one year ago today and took it over. If there's ever going to be a, a generation of revolutionaries raised, people wanting change, these kids are getting these kids are getting good experience as to what uh, what our what Indian relationship is with the government. Because this has been like all along the lines here, this has been a very peaceful protest. We occupied the island in the name of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. See, and, and the reality that all tr that treaties are laws, so it was really about law, it was really about a legal issue, not a moral or an ethical issue with the government's responsibilities. What Alcatraz meant was it meant for the first time we saw young Native people uh, standing up and saying, we have rights, we have, we have rights to the land, we have rights to our own government, and, uh, and we want to be listened to and we will be heard. Now what we have here is the model of our island and how we're going to have it. We will become an international outlet worldwide for authentic Indian art. And this will establish our base income to run the island and our university. Part of what we're saying on Alcatraz is that besides wanting the deed to the island for our cultural center, that we want to be treated as human beings, to be looked upon with respect as equals. Well, I can understand they might feel that way, but I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that if the federal government felt as though they should come off, that they would come off and pretty fast. Approximately a month before we were removed, the government called us together for a negotiation and said that they had a new proposal. They would lease us half of the island, and we could have job caretaking it. And they would give us $250,000. And we told them no, because it, wa it wasn't about that. We wanted them to legally recognize their responsibilities to the native community, which we were representing. So for us, it was all or nothing. This is, what, this is what it is that we need to have. And we will settle for nothing else. So they came in on June the 11th, uh, a SOG team, Special Operations Group, a U.S. Marshals, and they took the people that were on the island off the island. We were negotiating with the government concerning settling the Alcatraz issue. And they guaranteed us that no action would be taken against Alcatraz Indians as long as these negotiations were taking place. And then they turned around and they came out there and they took our people off the island. They called our attorney at 4.30 yesterday afternoon and told him that they would have word concerning the deed to the island. They would have it for us Monday morning. And that's what we were waiting for. And they came in while they were doing one thing with their left hand, they came in with their right hand. They lied to us. John uh, Trudell and Richard Oakes. Of, of all the leaders that came and went um, during the occupation of Alcatraz were able to articulate uh, our feelings and give a name to what we felt. And the name was independence and sovereignty and freedom and a right to our land. How does it feel to be here today? Well, lands and their rivers and most of all their dignity. They descended on the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the agency they want abolished. There were more than 500 Indians in the caravan today with thousands more expected tomorrow. They were angry and they wanted answers. We occupied the national headquarters of the BIA. It was a big embarrassment. To <laughs> we're talking about Nixon and Ehrlichman and Haldeman and John Mitchell and if people remember history. Well, just think of Ashcroft Croft and Bush and Wolfowitz and you're talking about these same mentalities. But we occupied that building and had it for a week. And the government was in a bind. See, and we pushed it pretty far. But we were pushing it again about the way the BIA was treating the people in the communities. We had a 20-point position paper that we were presenting to the, were, were presenting to the government about ways that they can, they can enact the treaty laws.
from D.C. when the occupation ended at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and traveling back out towards the West Country and uh, I'd stayed on with caravans that traveled through South Dakota and uh, I remember when we got to Pine Ridge, the, Dickie Wilson, the chairman, took a stance that he was going to uh, keep the American Indian movement off, off the reservation wherever he could. In February 1973, AIM and the traditional people of Pine Ridge occupied the village of Wounded Knee, taking a stand for the legal rights of the Lakota people under the Fort Laramie Treaty Law of 1868. The standoff continues at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. 200 Indians still occupy that small community and federal marshals still surround them. There were no incidents and no shooting today, fortunately. But there has been a lot of talking in a teepee talking between the Indians and government lawyers to try to find a way to end the impasse peacefully. AIM picked Wounded Knee, but the government picked South Dakota. All right? Because it shut down the momentum of AIM. The FBI noted that one of the things that AIM was shifting its direction towards was protecting the Earth. At the same time, some 27 multinational corporations were coming into this region, uranium and oil uh, and other mineral companies, and basically leasing and staking claims throughout the entire Black Hills region. During the same time period, uh, the FBI declared AIM to be one of the most dangerous organizations in the country, and they began discussing the need for paramilitary assaults on what they consider to be certain AIM strongholds. Pine Ridge, the capital of the reservation, is about 10 miles from Wounded Knee, but it's as tense as the small community which has been held by the militant Indians for six days now. The See, one of the things that, that the American government realized, and if they saw this at Alcatraz, and, and they saw that it, that it was really more pervasive, because they saw it in AIM, and that is that the majority of the American citizens agreed with us. Right? They, had, they felt some kind of sympathy or understanding. The majority agreed with us, right? That the government was in the wrong in its dealings and treatment of Native peoples. So, so, and to the government, the way the government operates, anytime any grassroots or any anytime any group of people start to get popular support, this becomes a threat to the government. AIM got labeled by this Eastland Subcommittee on Un-American Affairs as a terrorist organization. And between 73 and 75, the government with the FBI, they were waging, they were, they were liter literally waging a contra war against now all of the AIM people and the traditionalists, the ones who had supported Wounded Knee. They were trying to eliminate this thought. You could look at the film footage of the news media of, um, of FBI paramilitary units uh, engaging in sweeps or patrols, and it looked just like Vietnam. I mean, there was absolutely no difference. There were helicopters, there were armored personnel carriers, there were tanks, there were uh, a lot of uh, military equipment, and FBI agents who looked like they were in combat. In June 1975, two FBI agents were killed on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. The community that they launched their attack in was a community of Oglala. In the course of the firefight that took place that day, one of our people, Joseph Stunts, was killed, and two members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation were killed. And as a result of that, you know, three men stood trial for it, Gino Butler and Bob Robidoux and Palantir. Then that's when they kind of just put the finishing touches on the momentum that AIM had. We had that Oglala firefight and afterwards we got arrested you know he was the only one that came forward him and Neelock and Tina came to our defense and helped organize in the community and when we got to town and checked into this hotel and I turned on the news and all the news in these in the local stations was really talking about you know there were going to be terrorist attacks that the AIM militants were coming they were going to be disruptive they needed to have a lot of they need to have a lot more security and so they had created this paranoid climate. See, and all the media was carrying it. It's almost like, you know, like the government was writing it. You know, so we were not liked in that town. So we had an, a press conference. And right, I mean, right away and challenged them on it. Here are women and kids 
And they met with every church group. They met with every women's organization, every community organization. Met and just explained, look, we're just here. We don't want to be, you don't want us here. We don't want to be here. We just want the opportunity. And basically, through that kind of networking and then the, the reality that hold it, these, these aren't Indians, they're human beings. That reality was emerging in Cedar Rapids. And this juror got to see it, you know, because we had a positive influence in that community. And, and in the end, when push came to shove, on the jury deciding on guilt or innocence, this played a role. This is something that Tina gave to me as a parting gift. And somewhere in that haze and smoke, I recognized to follow where this writing would take me, to follow it, to just go with it. Whatever the madness, whatever the extreme I had to bounce around in, to follow the writing, and maybe someday I'd find some kind of center. This woman, this love, this life we dare to live, this society afraid of what people might see, might see through themselves or somebody else, might see what isn't meant to be hidden. Last time I saw her, Tina smiled, woman, woman's love, hands so gentle, eyes so wise. Woman touch, I am taken, world so undivided where the high wind flies. And somewhere a wild horse listens. I've often thought he was he was a living example of uh, of the line out of one of my songs that, that uh, Bobby McGee wears that freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. He had. Uh, Well, he had very little left to lose after they had taken his family away. And uh, <clears throat> I think it made him uh, fearless. So when I come to Canada asking for political... Crowd, I, think, you know, I think maybe you guys could just do, you know, 15 minutes or something. Yeah, because this is a rock and roll country. You get pretty loud, Don said. But I can get pretty loud myself. <laughs> so we did it. And she liked it. She liked it, and, and uh, I guess she recorded a little bit of it, played some for Jackson. So we went in and um, a few months later and, and recorded Tribal Voice. When I made Tribal Voice, the whole idea was to take spoken word and put it with more natural and indigenous sounds like the drum and the harmonies and the chants and to take these elements and mix them together and see what we could create that could be reproduced on tape uh, using the spoken word with the oldest musical form. Brown earth color woman takes me into the secrets of her size. When I step into the brown of her eyes, I find sight of special dreams, fluttering eyelashes and fluttering hearts, dancing in magic no one understands. When I step into the brown of her eyes, I find the comfort of a friend, a friend sharing shelter when only a friend can know to. I've been doing a lot of reading lately about um, your transition from political activist to poet to performer, and I'm struck by how many really talented people have rallied around your musical efforts. Bob Dylan called your first cassette with Jesse Ed Davis the album of the year in Rolling Stone. Um, it must be very affirming of your decision to put poetry to music. To have, to have recognition from these people or them to, re, to uh, look at my work and know that it makes sense to them and I'm communicating something to people that I've listened to through my life. I mean, they, these are people that influenced me. 
and to have them acknowledge me and however they've acknowledged me, you know, it, it helped, uh, it's what fed, helped to feed me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to keep it going. He had found uh, a partner, Jesse Ed Davis, who was a, a Kyla from Oklahoma, who came up to him in Long Beach and said, I, I can help you turn these into songs if you want to do that. And so within a very short time, he, he showed me a, you know, like a, you know, like a, a handful of uh, songs that he'd made with Jesse Ed Davis. And I knew Jesse Ed Davis because he played on my first record. He was a, a legend when I started making records. He was a guy that I was lucky to get on my record, a guy that anybody would have been you know, happy to be able to get if they could get him. He, he had played with uh, Leon Russell and Joe Cocker, and he, he went on to play with uh, Bob Dylan and John Lennon. Jesse was uh, funny, he was interesting, bright, one of the most intelligent guys you want to meet, and uh, he had a heart of gold. It was like having Clapton and George Harrison, and uh, you know, just a complete level of soul that the average guy in an average band cannot possibly attain. Jesse was, I think, you know, a genius, kind of a musical genius, and at the same time, you know, eventually was was a heroin addict. But the work he did with John is some of the best work he ever did. It was one of the, it was the thing that spoke directly to his experience. And when he stood up and when he came forward to say to John, "You know, I can help you turn into these into songs," I think he was speaking to. You the common understanding of what it was to be an Indian in America. Thank you. Thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here at the Palomino tonight with this extravaganza. Um, I'm real proud to be playing with John Trudell. I'm real proud to be an Indian. And this is uh, something I hope that doesn't go by you. The minute they hooked up, he knew they were brothers. It, you know, there's certain people that you meet in life that are just like that. You recognize them instantly, even though you've never met before. And that connection will go on throughout eternity. I wanted the thoughts, spoken word, the music, and the human energy. And I wanted to mix these things in such a way to see if we could create power. A man, a woman, a sort of love. She was a beautiful woman, but he did a lot of ugly things to turn her world around. In his own way, he loved her too, trying to be his own man conquer the world when he couldn't. She became his last stand. He was cowboys, she was Indian. He's a dangerous poet, a visionary. Sean's gonna make a change, a change, a change. Healing in his song, his song, his song. Sean's gonna make a change, a change, a change. Listen to your heart, your heart, your heart. from the cross in the name of their savior forcing on us the trinity of the change guilt sin and blame the trinity of the chain guilt sin and blame hanging from the cross hanging from the cross in a delusional grandeur 
they lie to us, then lie to themselves about lying to us, about lying to us. Hang from the cross, hang from the cross. In the name of the mother, the child, and the human spirit, Indians are Jesus. Hang from the cross, hang from the cross. Been driving up in a van with uh, I don't know if he painted that stuff on the side or not. It's got like prairie with missiles. You know that it was an old green Chevy van or Dodge van. And he opened the back door of it and all these girls ran out. You know, his daughters came charging out of the back of it. I mean it seemed like there were six or seven daughters that he had and they just ran around the place. <laughs> I remember that he used to pick us up every summer like no matter what if he had to like drive there or fly me wherever he was he would always come and get me and we would pick up the girls or the girls would meet us song and star and we would just travel and he would take us all over to these like different places sun dances powwows um people's houses just places i feel like to help us get in touch with who we are when we'd go on the road trips with him we would listen, he would buy oldies on tape, like, you know, from the billboard collections and stuff, and we would sing along with all the songs, and our two favorites were I'm a Wan the Wanderer, that was our song for the car, and uh, Born to be Wild, those are our favorites, and we used to just sing along with these songs all the time, I don't know, it was a lot of fun, it was like my fun memory as a traveling. When I was growing up with my mom in Canada, it was really hard because she, you know, there's a lot of drinking going on up there on the res and a lot of hard stuff to deal with growing up. And he totally saved us from that. He's always been there for me, no matter what. And I have to say, I was really difficult when I was young and I put him through a lot of shit, but he hung in there and he just stayed right there and he just always told me, no matter what you do, I will, I will always love you. So. I want to love my kids and make them feel as accepted, you know, for being who they are as he did for me. We are all children of Earth. Kids, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers. We are all children of Earth. Earth is a living entity. It is not in man's destiny to destroy the earth. That's arrogance. What it, what it is man's destiny to do is destroy civilized man's ability to live with the earth. So we as human beings, if we use, if we take responsibility for our lives and live our lives in a coherent manner, as coherent as we possibly can anyway, then we will have an influence into curing this disease. But this earth will not allow, the antibiotic will come <laughs> in a planetary sense. If it means open up the ozones and let it, let, it, let it wipe the civilized man out, then the earth will do that. The earth will continue on. Though. See, maybe, maybe we should be developing our loyalty to this planet and this earth and our future, our descendants, more than we should be to governing political systems that have created all these problems. See, but now we have, most people are trying to find solutions to problems, but they're trying to do it within the confines of, the confined abstractions of democracy. And so if they're not willing to think objectively about our responsibilities towards our own descendants, then they will come up with no solutions. They will only perpetuate the enslavement and feeding 